Hello everyone, and welcome to a new episode of Gaming in the Wild, a video games podcast about games from their interesting, creative, artistic, and often independently produced side of the spectrum. My name's John, I'm your host, I'm speaking to you from Reykjavik, Iceland, and this episode I'm going to talk about two main games, the first of which is a um, an indie classic released in 2012 by the Mike Bithell studio. It was the game that made Mike Bithell a kind of an indie dev celebrity, I guess. Later in the show, I'll talk about a more recent release, indie release called Piku Niku. Um, and after that, I'm going to talk about my experience playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey which I've been utterly absorbed in over the last week or so. But before that, let's begin with a game about friendship and jumping. And that game is called Thomas Was Alone. So I first heard about this game actually listening to the podcast that the developer Mike Bithell makes with Alana Pierce, um, an ex-IGN journalist turned YouTuber, um, and Austin Wintry, the musician and game soundtrack artist, is also on the podcast, and Troy Baker, the voice actor. But Mike Bithell is on there too. And um, as well as talking about the games and game-related issues of the day. Um, The work of the hosts generally sort of springs up in the conversation in that podcast. And so I heard Mike Bethel talk about Thomas Was Alone in the context of his own career, and I hadn't heard of the game before. Um, So I went and looked for it, and it turns out, lo and behold, as has often been the case, with um, games that I've been interested in for one reason or another that are of a certain age, it was on PS Now. So um, I think it's playable as a PlayStation 3 game, but um, I downloaded it for my PlayStation 4 and I played through it in a single sitting. It took me three or four hours to complete it. I played through it all in in one night. Um, and it's it's quite a striking game. It's um It's strikingly minimalist. You play as Thomas to begin with, and Thomas is a a red rectangle. Simple as that. And the game has a voiceover, and it begins with the line, Thomas was alone. And so you begin a red rectangle in a black space, and your aim in the first level is just to get to the end. You move across the space, you slot into a a white um, line shape of the rectangle of Thomas, And that's the portal, and then you're gone through to the next space. So at its most basic level, it's a puzzle platformer, and you will travel through 100 levels divided into sets of 10. And the aim is always just to pass through whatever hazards are put in your path, and they get increasingly complicated and get to the end of the level. And within a few levels, we're introduced to another character, um, which is a small orange square, which can't quite jump as high as Thomas. And so it has to, um, Thomas has to help this little square across the levels and other shapes will come into play and it basically becomes a game about teamwork, um, which I guess is where the description of being about friendship and jumping comes from. Um, Because while it's ostensibly a puzzle game, and if there was no narrative, it would still be fun, you know. Like the little orange square has to stack against a high wall, and then Thomas can jump up or help it across, and so forth. There's a a blue square that can float and ferry ferry other shapes across um, water, and like the shapes that you will encounter have like increasingly varied abilities, but all of them are required to get through the levels. But where the game 
really comes to life is that the narrative ascribes a name to each of them. So the little orange square is called Chris, and then the other shapes, like a, a stick figure, like the Tetris straight, and like a big square. They're called different things, like Claire and Laura and John. And the game gives them all personalities. So where Thomas is kind of curious and optimistic and open-minded about the situation that he finds himself in, uh, Chris is like a initially kind of sceptical and suspicious of Thomas. And then uh, Claire, the big blue square, is kind of self-conscious but realises that she can float and then starts to perceive of herself as a superhero who can help these other shapes. And John, the, the, the tall, bouncing, straight uh, oblong, is very, very overconfident and um, thinks of himself as the leader and all of this kind of stuff. So the game starts to kind of take this very basic, um, fun, puzzle, platform um, frame and to put into it this kind of really amicable, amusing uh, narrative. And that is that um, each shape is a different AI which has been made by a company called Artificial Life Solutions. And they have, for one reason or another, um, become conscious. And so what we're seeing is a visualization of a virtual space and these AIs are trying to move through it. And why they're trying to move through it and where they're trying to get is all the kind of plot points of the game that I won't spoil. But the game does a great job of taking a kind of a very basic premise with these kind of resolutely minimalist graphics, like there is almost nothing to it. It's just small shapes, kind of a blurry black background. Um, occasionally there are some sort of very basic lighting effects just to kind of add some visual appeal to it, I guess. There's a really nice ambient soundtrack that, that soothes you along and this spoken narrative. And uh, with these simple elements, the game manages to tell a really cool story that really hooks you in. Um, and when I first completed it, I tweeted out this is a game that makes you feel emotionally attached to simple geometric forms. Imagine if like, uh, if a game of Tetris was actually a story, a saga about the, the T shape, having to work alongside the square and the stick in order to, to make Tetris happen and to, you know, find its way through life problems. <laughs> and so by the end of the level, and by the end of this game, you feel super emotionally attached to these kind of minimalist figures that have been ascribed personalities and characters in a really interesting way. So I think that's why Thomas Was Alone was, was such a big hit. Um, it does a lot with a little. And it was a big hit. I understand from looking at it on Google that the game sold over a million copies, which allowed Mike Bithell to form his own studio. He did this one on um, nights, basically, while he was working at another studio. And the game went on to win a BAFTA award for the voiceover, which was by Danny Wallace, the comedian. A humorist, according to his Wikipedia page. And the music by David Housden was also nominated, as was Mike's writing on the game. So this, this game that was made as a kind of a, an indie side project back at the time when indie games were kind of a new phenomenon on consoles, at least, went on to become kind of a um, proof of concept that you can take a simple, ingenious indie game made with a really low budget I think it was made for £7,000 or something like that, with um, 2,000 of those raised through a Kickstarter to get Danny Wallace to do the voiceover. Um, and that's without Mike Bithell's pay on the game. But I guess his pay was that this this, this gamble paid off um, after the BAFTAs and stuff and the income that he'd gotten from this game. He was able to go and start his own studio. He's since made volume and subsurface circular neither of which i've played but both of which i'm going to go and visit now because this game is just super charming so as well as being like a really interesting part of indie game history 
and the start of the the Bithel studio and whatever comes next out of that, which I'm really looking forward to. It's been released on Xbox, PlayStation, Steam, etc. It's not on the Nintendo Switch, uh, unfortunately. I think it would be really good for that console. But I understand that maybe it um, feels like the time has gone for additional ports of this one. But if you can get your hands on it, I really recommend it. That's Thomas Was Alone. The second game I'm going to talk about this episode is another indie game. This one came out in 2019. It was made by a Franco-English group called Sector Dub and published by Devolver Digital. Um, If you listen regularly, you'll know I'm a big fan of Devolver's output. They're a really reliable game publisher. Almost everything I've played of theirs, I've loved. But I picked this one up. Um, without knowing anything about uh, Devolver or the the creator of it. I saw it in the Nintendo Switch eStore for, I think, £3 or something. And it just had this super cute, colourful cover of um, a kind of a, a red blob with legs and little black eyes. Um, and I thought, I think I'll spend £3 on this just to see what it's about. It's a good name, it's, it looks interesting. And it's, it's a really funny one. Um... You play a character called Piku, who wakes up in a cave. It's a little bit like a kind of version of the the beginning of Hollow Knight, where you wake up in a cave and you emerge without really knowing who you are into a strange world that you then have to go and explore. But other than some very light Metroidvania elements, that's that's where the similarity with Hollow Knight ends. It couldn't be further from that game in atmosphere, um, where Hollow Knight is dark. Piku Niku is ridiculously colourful, ridiculously cheerful. So you come out of the cave, you're a little uh, sort of jelly ball with very long legs, and the graphic style couldn't be simpler. It's almost as simple as Thomas was alone. Um, Your character has these kind of rubbery legs, and so as you walk along, it does this kind of hilarious, wobbly little walk, uh, and you can kick out with your legs, and you can kick pretty much anything in the game world. Uh, and the game world is, is rendered in just, you know, the floor is green, the sky is blue, the puffy clouds are white and look like they were drawn by a five-year-old. It's incredibly simple, and it has a very jaunty soundtrack. And so you emerge from your cave, and you quickly find out there is a little village down at the bottom of the hill where it's it's inhabited by these sort of jellyish blobs, <laughs> a little like you, but a little different. And they are all convinced that Piku is this, um, let me see how they phrase it, ghostly beast of legend. And so they are all absolutely terrified of Piku, thinking that it's a kind of a mythical monster that's going to come and destroy them all. But they, they find out after putting it in a cage and poking it a little bit <laughs> that it's actually just a harmless creature um, with really rubbery legs. And so they let, they let it out, and um, and so the game begins. Um, and it turns out that this town is being robbed of all of its natural resources by Mr. Sunshine and the Sunshine Company. And what Mr. Sunshine does is that he rains down free money onto the the township so they can all live their lives um, and then hoovers up all of their natural resources um, including water and plants and trees and so forth and so what this game becomes is a kind of hilarious lo-fi platform adventure in which you basically have to take down capitalism <laughs> by with your big rubbery legs and Piku can, it turns out, use his legs to do things like grip onto rings and propel himself high up into the air and to cross big spaces, uh, as well as the kicking. And you get other abilities, like uh, you can wear hats, one of which is a pencil that you can use to draw a, an image uh, for a competition. And then there's a, a, a sub-game where you have to use your rubbery legs to be in a dance contest. Um, and there's all kinds of different little sub-games. You have to play hide-and-seek with a rock 
which looks like every other rock in the game. So you just have to walk around kicking rocks until you find it. Um, there's a sport called Bass Kick, so there's like a kind of a sport sub game, um, and then there's all these kind of weird little sub games. Like a one one of the villagers has a broken toaster, and so you kick the toaster to try and make it work, and you're sucked into a, a sub level called Toastopia with a giant slice of toast that kind of shouts at you for a while. <laughs> and you just move through this very surreal, very funny game. The dialogue is really hilarious, honestly. I, I laughed out loud throughout my playtime with this one. It really has genuinely sparkling dialogue, um, and along with this kind of silly, fun music and the visual style of it. It's just a super, super joyful experience. And it's a really funny contrast to Thomas Was Alone. Uh, Thomas with this kind of modernist sort of Mondrian Bauhaus minimalism thing going on. And then Pikuniku with this kind of slightly ridiculous cartoony minimalism. Both of them have um, a strong element of humour and a strong sort of art direction style that's been taken to make them what they are. Um, there is no voice acting in Pikuniku. It's all just kind of little Animal Crossing voices. Um, but it's it's just a fabulous play. Um, it's often on sale, so you can probably get it for just a couple of pounds. It's on Steam, Switch, and Xbox. It's probably one of the only games that I think I've spoken about on, on this uh, podcast that is available on Steam, Switch, Xbox, and not PlayStation. And it's a genuinely enjoyable game world, which has just got something interesting to do around every corner. Even after you finish the story, which I think is like three, four hours maximum, probably. Um, there's loads to do. You can just go back into the world and finish all the things that you didn't get around to. And there is quite a lot to do. There's lots of coins to collect. There's lots of different um, hats that Pikaniku can wear that give him different abilities. There's all kinds of different hidden levels. You get a little watering can hat that can water flowers throughout the game. But you get it about halfway through. So, I mean, I went back and played the first half of the game again, just watering all the flowers to find all of the hidden areas that I couldn't access first time around. There are entire um, game world areas that you can't find until you've got your different uh, abilities. So you can go back and play it again if it's the kind of game that, like a short hike, um, which came out for Switch recently, it's maybe the kind of game that you can just dip into just for some fun. Just walk around and not really have to think too hard about it and just kick some little jelly people around a little bit and go and pick up some coins and climb onto some clouds that you've never been onto before. It's just a really good mood game. So that's another recommendation. Um, pick it up when it's on sale, or I think it's just probably a few pounds anyway. That's Pika Niku. <laughs> And from two really small budget indie games to maybe one of the, the biggest budget games that has ever been produced. Um, so a little crunching gear change there in the, the coverage on this this episode. Um, the game that I've been playing across the last uh, week or 10 days and have managed to get um, almost 30 hours into already is Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Um, I bought this one when I got the PS4. I had picked up like a handful of games. The game that I got the console for was Control. And I'd also been curious to play some indies like Everybody's Gone to the Rapture and uh, The Last Guardian, both of which I've spoken about before. But um, I had a couple of recommendations from my friend Kieran, um, who is on Twitter at Radical Art Review and at CMG Daily. And he said, you've got to get Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And I had never played an Assassin's Creed game before. Um, but between buying this game and playing it, I have played Black Flag on the Switch, which um, is like a kind of a big highlight and fan favourite in this, this massive blockbuster series of games. Um, and so I didn't really know what to expect. I enjoyed Black Flag, but I kind of plateaued with it. I kind of... Um, it's, you know, it's the piracy version of Assassin's Creed, so you play a pirate character, you get control of a ship, and you sail around the world doing Assassin's Creed-y stuff, like uh, doing missions, like assassinations, and tailing people to find out their secrets, and 
uh, looting things and causing trouble. Um, and you get a pirate ship and you can go and do pirate conquests and take down other ships and so forth alongside a narrative. Um, all of the Assassin's Creed games have this meta narrative of being about like a, a modern corporation that has invented this technology that allows people to leap into the past um, and inhabit characters from the past to live out history and in doing so to investigate a mysterious organization that has spanned the eons basically um, and that, that kind of aspect of Assassin's Creed is um, in the early games I understand is what people found interesting about it but has become a bit of an albatross around the series neck by this point where they're just making games that are about you know ancient Greece or about Vikings or about you know the Romans or whatever but they're having to kind of staple this this uh, slightly done narrative at this point about this company Abstigo but I think that they've learned by this point in the series that people are mostly just interested in being a pirate or being a ancient Greek warrior and so it's really kept to a minimum in this Assassin's Creed game. It's set in ancient Greece, in the Peloponnesian War between the Spartans and uh, the Athenians. And you play a character called Cassandra. And you are the daughter of the Spartan general Leonidas I. And Leonidas is an actual historical figure. And I think that what the Assassin's Creed games, at least the more recent ones, Actually, maybe all, the whole series has done well, has been to kind of pepper in um, real historical scenarios and um, versions of historical cities that are like, for various gameplay reasons, often kind of remixed greatest hits versions of these ancient cities that exist as a kind of a virtual theme park version of them. And you can hang around with historical figures, um, but these historical figures are... Um, approximations and the, the world events in which the games take place are approximations of real historical events with this uh, extra narrative which is that there has been like a kind of a guiding hand behind a lot of history and so whilst you play Cassandra who is a mercenary in ancient Greek times so she's traveling around the different Greek islands um, getting into all kinds of trouble exploring going to uh, shrines, going to Athens, going to all these different Greek islands where there's different um, little battles going on within the war. And the gameplay loop is that um, you can kind of take your ship, come into harbour, uh, explore the town, talk to some people, get some little missions and mercenary-ish side quests to do that are really varied. They They vary from like escorting someone somewhere to sabotaging someone to hit jobs to finding lost treasures or even just tipping the balance of of the war in this individual locale um, but where this one is different to black flag is that in black flag i felt like i had seen what the game had to offer pretty quickly and i just tailed off and in this game there is just so much to do there's so much scope it's the biggest map i've ever seen in an open world game um, there's so much to do that it just doesn't feel like I've seen it all yet, even 30 hours in. Um, and that's quite an achievement, really. Um, I think Ubisoft comes in for very fair criticism that they have a kind of a, a game gameplay model where you are given a bunch of fetch quests to do and you have to do a lot of grinding for levels or repeating kind of a tight gameplay loop to kind of eventually get where you need to be. And there's lots of leveling up. And there's lots of doing the same thing again and again and again. But in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, it feels like there's something new around every corner. Um, I think I was playing it today, and I thought I'd seen everything at this point with the, the battles and the quests and all of this stuff. And I found like a, a tomb, and I went down there, and there was a massive sort of half-hour section of gameplay that was like Tomb Raider-ish, breaking through walls and kind of solving puzzles and and a kind of Indiana Jones section where there's a floor covered with snakes that I had to throw a torch onto and burn them all away. And then there's some sort of treasure down there or there's some mythical monsters dotted around the landscape too. I've only just come across my first mythical creature. 
it was a, a famous hind that had um like a, a giant deer that had huge gold antlers so i had a sort of an epic battle with that thing and so even after 30 hours i haven't seen what this game has to offer and i told a friend of mine who is an actual greek uh, historian and a classics professor i told him i was playing this game and he's been really interested in the assassin's creed games because he's read about them um and he sent me this video of um a historian for the Invicta YouTube channel using the Assassin's Creed Odyssey tourism mode, which is like a kind of a combat-free, narrative-free version where you can just explore Athens and explore Delphi and all of these kind of historical sites. And this historian's using them as a jumping-off point to talk about those times because the game is so incredibly detailed the, he was walking through these um, environments, talking about things like how ships were built back then. And you can walk through a shipyard and see the, the wood being piled up and imported, and then how the ship frame is built, how it's kind of got these dowels that are put into it to seal the wood closed. And then as he walked around the shipyard, it went all the way through to ships being launched and floating in the water. And so, so much research has gone into this game that the environment is entirely convincing and entirely absorbing and much of it is really historically accurate like there was another video where they walk around a classic um, Athenian household and everything from like the kind of food that is in the, the pantry area to the fact that it's based around a central square where the family meets and that there is kind of a entertainment room at the front and then quarters at the back and um, and all of the decor and the friezes and the you know the tiles and the types of pillars that are there it's all historically accurate i mean not not all there was one really funny video where the historian guest got very pissy about the fact that they'd used the wrong kind of tiles and the wrong kind of columns in in a kind of a, a crumbling ruin on some greek island it was partially based on the historical one but it had been juiced up to make it more fun for the player and some of the the streets have been widened so that it's more easy to move around the cities and things like this. So it's been adapted for gameplay. And some of the, you know, the cities have been compressed a little to make them easier to move around and this kind of thing. But I thought that was really interesting that Ubisoft had made this game as a gameplay environment. And that it's actually so historically well researched that it's being used in this way now. So, I mean, that's part of the pleasure of Assassin's Creed Odyssey is just walking around, uh, taking in these breathtaking natural landscapes, which just seem to go on forever, and sailing between islands, and then all of the detail of the cities, the characters that you meet, historical figures that you meet. And then, of course, there's like, you know, there's lots of combat and there's lots of Assassin's Creed gameplay. Sure, you have to take people out and all this kind of stuff, but it's just... A really expansive, addictive, um, well-made game, and I've been having a great time with it. So, as well as the the indie games at the start of the show, of Thomas Was Alone and Piku Niku, both of which I finished in one sitting, Assassin's Creed Odyssey, I've been uh, completely addicted to. Thirty hours in, and still not sick of it. Um, apparently, that's not even halfway. Um, so I've got lots more of that game to play. And maybe I'll have more thoughts about it later. But I really enjoyed that game. It's um, it's like an RPG version of Assassin's Creed. So you can kind of build up your character. There's skill trees and all this kind of stuff. And you can, you can um, customise your character to be the way that you want her to be. With the, the skills that suit your play style. Really fun. That's Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So that's what I've been playing recently. I know it's a bit of a, a disparate selection this time, but I hope you enjoyed hearing about those games. I've got a bunch of other stuff going on too. Um, there's a huge Nintendo Switch eShop sale at the moment, um, so I picked up a few games in that sale. I picked up uh, Yoshi's Crafted World. It's like a kind of a cross between Yoshi's Island and Paper Mario. 
So it's like a, it is a crafted world, like all of the environments made out of paper and cardboard. Um, it's a really fun, jolly, like well-made Nintendo game basically. So I've been having a lot of fun with that. Um, and there's a bunch of other games that are on sale too actually. I noticed that some of the games that I've covered on the show are on sale currently. Um, so if you happen to have a, a Switch, now is a great time to pick up games like Katamari Damacy, crazy Japanese rolling game where you just roll up a bunch of stuff into a giant ball. It's a really strange game. Um, recommend digging out the, the episode on that one if you're interested. There's another great game called Donut County that's on sale for just four dollars um, and that's a kind of a cartoon game where you play as a raccoon who controls these kind of holes that move around on the ground and you just kind of suck stuff into them. It's like a really enjoyable relaxing puzzle game um, and if you're not quite ready to jump into Assassin's Creed Odyssey but fancy dipping a toe in the water um, Assassin's Creed 3 is for sale for fifteen dollars on the Switch right now. Um, also Child of Light it's um, a really beautiful watercolour fairy tale platform game is uh, reduced from twenty dollars down to five. Um, what remains of Edith Finch, which is a really really fun single sitting story game, where you walk around a kind of a huge, strange, teetering sort of Tim Burton style mansion, uncovering your family's strange and morbid history. What Remains of Edith Finch is $7.99. And there are loads more games on sale. It's a really good sale at the moment. So if you feel like stocking up on a few games for as little money as possible, it's a good time to dip into the Nintendo Switch eShop. Um, I've also published a couple of reviews lately. I've been reviewing games again. I reviewed Manifold Garden for the Nintendo World Report. Gave it an 8.5 out of 10 and a glowing review. Really enjoyed that game. That recently launched on Switch, PlayStation, Xbox. And I also reviewed a short hike for Switch Indie Fix and gave it a straight 10 out of 10. That game is now on Switch too. So if you want to see those reviews, um, I've posted links to them on Twitter and on my Instagram. You can follow me on both of those places as Gaming in the Wild. I'm also on Twitch and YouTube as Gaming in the Wild too. I will stream some of the games that I've talked about today on Twitch over the next week. So you're welcome to come along and join me on Twitch, join in the chat and say hello. I also love hearing from people that are listening to the show. This is the 20th episode and I'm really happy to have gotten to 20. So thanks very much for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back next week with some more game reviews and some updates and stuff. So come say hello on social media, Gaming in the Wild. And thanks very much for listening. Take care of yourselves and each other. Bye bye.